Well, we started last week this campaign in a series, The Warm Homes Project. And we are seeking to be the church that is going to love and support and empower the church in Lebanon as they love and they serve those who are in desperate need, many who happen to be Syrian refugees. Now, last week, for the first time in a long time, a man named Richard stepped into church, into this church, because he lives right next door in Azur, and every day he looks out and sees our building. Well, Richard has a historic sort of Catholic background. He hadn't been to church for worship in about 30 years. So I think it's fair to say, safe to say, that faith was not a really active part of his life. But last week, for some reason, he felt compelled to come on down and just come right across and and join us. And he was blessed to be here. He was blessed by the experience. He was blessed by your hospitality. Oh, and did I mention he's from Lebanon? Well, to me, call that a bit of a divine coincidence, where someone who hadn't been in worship in 30 years steps in last week and finds out we're doing a project related to his country. And so I had the opportunity to meet Richard after worship, talk to him for just a few minutes, and Richard said to me, if there's anything that I can do to help you in this project, let me know. I said, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Now, you should know Richard is... uh, You know, he's an educated man. He's a world traveler, a businessman. And uh, it was just really interesting to to talk with him for a few minutes. And because he offered to help, I then got a hold of him and had a coffee with him at Reset this past week. A fascinating conversation. And at the end of the conversation, I said to Richard, look, I, I don't want to be opportunistic here. I'm not in any way trying to use you. But hey, you step foot into church last Sunday for the first time in a long time, and this is what we're doing, and you offered to help, so would you be willing to join me on stage and just have a little conversation for five minutes? And he hesitantly agreed. As you'll see, Richard is a great conversationalist, although he doesn't necessarily like to be in front of crowds, Uh, so we're just going to have a little conversation together. So Richard, if you want to come forward, and we're going to sit on these plastic chairs which I almost didn't get past the sort of decorating committee to get on stage. Um, But I had to kind of remind them, we're not necessarily going for pretty here. Um, And and Richard, just correct me if I'm wrong. You can grab here. This is the mic we'll use. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in my experience in the Middle East, these chairs are everywhere. Well, it's definitely right. Part of our culture. Okay, great. So they may not be the most aesthetically part pleasing part of our decor, but they are authentic. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, before we start, uh, Pastor Steve, I was not reluctant to be here uh, with this very fine, talented young gentleman because of the subject or because of any subject per se. Uh, As Pastor Steve said, I've been away from attending uh, churches and so on for the past 30 years, so it's not my comfort zone. And uh, last week when I decided, I said to God, uh, I want to sit somewhere in the back, be invisible, and just, uh, you know, (laughs) live the experience. Uh, I guess uh, God is a kind of a fast-tracking guy, (coughs) and he put me here, and okay, I cannot say no. (laughs) Sorry. Hey, you, you came here, all right? So, and then you agreed to have coffee with me. So um, thank you so much. And uh, I trust that, yeah, we'll be blessed just to have a few minutes of, of conversation. And maybe you could begin just by saying a little bit about what it was like to grow up in Lebanon. And uh, yeah, your parents are still there. Um, get, just tell us a little bit about your childhood, your family. Um. Well, typically, I, I was born and I grew up in a, in a kind of a middle-class uh, Lebanese Christian family back in the 70s and 80s. 
Um, these were the, the times of uh, war, a very destructive, secular, bloody, uh, we're not proud of it, simply between the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, so this is what I can say now. Um, what about your father? You know, the vivid memory of, of, of the war is my father because he was an officer in the Lebanese army. Okay, and just to put it in the right context for you, uh, like, you know, Canadians far away from, from the scene, the Lebanese army was not one army as such. It was split into two. Okay, because we are Christians, my father was serving with the Christian Lebanese army, fighting, unfortunately, the Muslim mercenaries and so on. And even the capital was split into two between 1975 and 1990. The western part of Beirut was controlled by the Muslim uh, militias, uh, backed up by the uh, Palestinian mercenaries. And uh, eventually, a couple of years after, backed up strongly by the Syrian army. And I know that the civil war in Lebanon was, I mean, a devastating experience, loss of life, destruction in the country, destruction in Beirut, and a complicated one. Like the geopolitical situation, I have a little sense of that in the big picture of the Middle East, but I mean in Lebanon specifically, everyone was involved from the Americans and to the Israelis to the Syrians and the Palestinians and the Saudis, and Lebanon was almost a, a bit of a pawn in, in some of these greater world powers, and tragic really, right? But by the time you were a teenager or so, practically speaking, it was the Syrian army that was in control. Is that correct? And then what was it like to live under the Syrian army? I, I don't want to, uh, you know, we are honest here, we are in the church. I cannot sugarcoat it. The Syrian army has nothing to do with what you know of regular armies. It's not like, uh, sorry, yeah, my voice was heard. So they were hostile. Frankly, they were abusive, um, kind of barbaric, and not only to Christians, to all Lebanese, but especially Christians because we fought them, we resisted, we had uh, many battles uh, on and off, so we were uh, in the eye of the storm with them. T tell me that story, I mean, sort of just a, a symbolic story, and there's many such stories, but... You were going with your family to your father's hometown, which meant crossing numerous Syrian checkpoints. Yes. What was that like? Uh, yeah, yeah, this reminds me, it's, it's such a symbolic story that uh, every Lebanese can associate with at a moment or another. Um, you know, we live, uh, as I said, you know, Beirut was split into Eastern for the Christians and Western for the Muslims. and. Um, we, our house was in a city, small city called Junie. Junie was so, the so-called uh, Christian uh, capital of, of uh, Eastern Beirut. But my parents were originally from the Beka Valley, uh, which is pretty far away from our city. So to go there, we have to cross multiple uh, checkpoints by, uh, by the Syrian army. And because my father was an officer, who was technically the enemy, so he was always sitting in the back seat with my siblings, definitely wearing civilian clothes with a civilian ID. I was a designated driver at 13 or 14 years old. I don't want the youngster here to have ideas, but <laughs> this was Lebanon, 70s and 80s, wartime, no rule of law, no G1, G2, G, nothing. Okay? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it, uh, it, it is sad, actually, uh, when you remember it. A young teenager driving his family, so stressed, okay, and believe me, each and every checkpoint, they don't miss it as they are trained. All kind of abusive, you know, they abuse you, they uh, bully you, they simply provoke you, okay? The agenda was uh, me or any of my compatriots to, to, uh, to talk back, to lose the temper. And once you lose the temper, it is not like, you know, simple jail. You vanish, you're done. 
and this is not fiction because up to today, we are in 2021, they say we, we have around 10,000 to 15,000 missing Lebanese, mostly Christians, in the jails of Syria, maybe dead, tortured, killed, everything. Yeah. Tragic. Yeah. And so as yes. soon as you could, basically, um, you got out of there. Educated in Paris, became a world-traveling businessman, but you had family who stayed behind. And your parents are still near Beirut, you own a home in Beirut, you tra travel regularly back to Lebanon. Just give us a minute of what is the situation like on the ground today? Okay, uh, the war is over, technically, since 1990, and then we had uh, the occupation, the Syrian occupation up to 2005. But may I say, since 2019, the situation in Beirut, in Lebanon, is the worst ever. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, we did not live such bad times since the formation of this small country, since 100 years. Uh, literally, we have a failed state. The government failed, totally. No rule of law whatsoever. The economy is beyond depression. Okay? No infrastructure, no power, no petrol, no gas, no food supplies. The situation in Lebanon since uh, fall 2019 is really bad. Uh, I can give a small example which I doubt uh, my Cam Canadian friends here would understand because I tried hard to make them understand. The banks in Lebanon, you know, like you have here RBC and Bank of Montreal and all of this, the banks, the private banks in Lebanon collectively, uh, uh, sorry, to say these banks are owned by parapolitical corrupt figures. They collectively scammed an entire population. All our deposits, all our savings, were overnight confiscated. Can you imagine going to RBC tomorrow and telling you, sir, ma'am, you don't have money with us? Definitely, you can go to, uh, to the court and sue them. As I said, in Lebanon, we don't have uh, rule of law. And uh, we said we have hit rock bottom. And then the explosion happened back in August 2020. Um, I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, they say it is the second uh, biggest explosion after Hiroshima nuclear bomb in World War II. It is like a mini nuclear bomb. CNN, BBC talked about it in a matter of seconds, just maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. We had around 250, 300 killed around 8,000 injured, and maybe you'll be shocked, around 500, half a million of uh, the capital citizens, residents there, were displaced. So it is a catastrophe by, by all means. Hmm. So that paints a little bit of living color of the situation on the ground, and it's one thing to maybe read about it or hear about it on the news, it's another thing to hear about it from someone who's been there, who's family there, who's lived there. And in the midst of all that suffering that the Lebanese are experiencing, the Church of Lebanon is still helping, still serving Syrian refugees. Absolutely. And these were people who, I mean, occupied, oppressed, people who just came into the country, a country that could barely support its own population. And now we're talking a million and a half plus Syrian refugees entering into essentially a failed state, as you said. Uh, How does the average Lebanese person feel about the Syrian refugees? Uh, okay, al allow me, uh, Pastor Steve, to just put it in a context where our family here, our friends, can understand it, because I'm not talking here to a Lebanese public. You know, I told you about all this tragedy, but uh, the Syrian refugee came as a cherry on top. We had around two million. I don't know, the figure you mentioned uh, last uh, Sunday was 1.5. The figure that I know is two million. Mm. Two million in a Lebanese context of a population of four million only. So 50% of our population in a matter of days and weeks 
fled to our country. So, like, Canada is 40 million. Can you imagine, God forbid, okay, 20 million refugees fleeing in a matter of weeks to your country? As nice as you are, as uh, Christians as you are, this is a big shock at all level, economy, political, social, uh, demographics, and so on. So, I don't want to sound... It's hard. I don't want to sound rude, but I have to be realistic. Pastor Steve, if you take any of the fine gentlemen and kind ladies and do a survey in Lebanon today, with all honesty, and ask the average stereotype Lebanese, okay, what do you feel about your neighbors? Okay, they will tell you, okay, we appreciate what you're doing. We, we really appreciate your mission, your uh, Christianity, the values, the principles, but we need help, okay? Yes, they are victims, and they are, by the way, the same victims as we are, because the Syrian army, and I told that to Pastor Steve, the Syrian army, who is the offender, did abuse us, and now he's abusing, uh, it's abusing uh, its own uh, people. So we associate, but we don't have that much of enthusiasm the way the Western world has it, uh, because of our... Uh, Capabilities. We don't have today capabilities. These 50% of our population need to use our failed infrastructure. Forget, please, about Canada or USA or Europe. It's a failed infrastructure. They are going to uh, compete with us on jobs that are not available even. Yeah. You, yeah, see, yeah. you see the entire picture. Absolutely. And I know you make and you say the Lebanese people can make a bit of a distinction between the Syrian people, the Syrian refugees, and the Syrian army. Of course. Right? I mean, you recognize the Syrian refugees are victims, much like the Lebanese Christians were victims of the Syrian army. Yes. Um, but on, on so many levels, and this is what I just want to end our conversation with, because it just became profoundly clear to me in the conversation I had with Richard earlier this week, the church in Lebanon is doing what Jesus said and that they are called to love their enemies. Right? It is not in any form of self-interest. I mean, it's an incredible drain on resources. I mean, it is within living memory, the people who were still a part of that sort of oppression. We are helping the church be the church in a really profound way. And our project, yes, it helps Syrian refugees, but also Lebanese who are in desperate need. So, if I may, uh, please, Pastor yeah. Steve, uh, sorry to interrupt Wrap you. Wrap this up. <laughs> All what I talked about it, really, this is my message, you know. As hurt as we are, and as far away as you are, my message today, okay, please do forget whatever I said in the past five minutes. Do forget about Lebanese economy, demographics, uh, you know, threat of its balance. Uh, worldwide agendas and these big nations uh, strategies and uh, so on and so forth. Last week I was inspired by a photo, it's not displayed today on the screen. Uh, Can you put that picture up? Yeah, we used this that one, last week. Exactly this message. one. Please do forget about whatever I said with all modesty because I forgot when I looked at this picture, okay, this is simply a mother, can be any of you ladies, God forbids, this baby can be, you know, our children, our sisters and brothers. This family need to eat today. Not tomorrow, not after one month, not after one, today. They need to have a shelter. They need to have a roof on top of their head today. They need to have blankets, mattresses. These things we don't, you know, my family is Canadian. We don't even think about it here. So please forget about what we talked about it from somebody who is much hurt than all of you, I say we forget and we focus about these families and help them, as Christian as we are. Hmm. Thank you, Richard.